If you take the ratio of miles traveled to passengers transported, air transport is going to be the safest. For one million regular flights, there are only four aviation accidents, and this number is inevitably decreasing with each passing year. So what is behind these cold hard figures? And who do we, the regular passengers, have to thank for it? My name is Alexander Koltevoy, and today I'm going to find the answers to these questions. This is a Boeing 757, one of the safest planes in the world. In one and a half hours, it will take off to Blagoveshensk. And this one and a half hour period is a rush hour for the team of technical specialists. They are going to check over a hundred parameters to make sure the plane can be sent out on a flight. The engineering crew splits up, everyone with their own task. Everything that needs to be checked is specified in the checklist. Today, it'd be impossible to render maintenance services to even a single commercial plane without a multi-volume regulation behind it. And all these procedures were defined at the aircraft design stage. When constructing any aircraft, we must strike a balance of weight and durability. At takeoff, this wing must lift a 115-ton vehicle into the air without braking. Before any commercial airplane gets a green light, the pre-production models undergo extensive tests. In our country, they are conducted at SAGI, the Central Institute of Aerodynamics. It has been operating for almost 100 years, and every single plane constructed in our country went through its laboratories and test benches. There are over 60 gas dynamics facility wind tunnels which help simulate the flight conditions at speeds ranging from 32 feet to 5 miles per second. The T101 vertical wind tunnel is one of the largest in the world. Its width is 78 feet and the engine power here is 30 megawatts. You can tap out a whole life-size fighter plane in here. By the way, the concept of the wind tunnel was tested by the Wright brothers in the process of the Flyer 1 designing, and it almost hasn't changed since. The model is mounted on the scale that accurately measures the resulting buoyancy at different positions of the aircraft. These data are useful for aircraft design. Vertical wind tunnels allow determining how the vehicle behaves in supercritical flight modes. For example, like falling into a spin. This is also a mandatory part of the research. Besides the aerodynamics testing of new aircraft, scientists at SAGI study the structural toughness. This is especially important when it comes to new materials. There's decade-long, long-term statistics when it comes to aluminum, steel, or titanium that confirms their properties, confirms the effectiveness of these materials in the structure, which we don't have for composite materials yet. The main thing is to ensure the flight safety. We performed power tests and stiffness tests on sample models and full-scale structures for six years. That means that there was a large-scale test of the structure, and the research was conducted on materials to make sure that an aircraft with such wings would actually be safe. Static and endurance test benches are used to study the aircraft behavior throughout its entire life course. This is the static testing laboratory for full-scale structures, which can be used to test vehicles with a takeoff weight of up to 250 tons. The primary objective of the research is to find out what loads the airplane structure can withstand. And these data are very important because, in many ways, the future weight of the aircraft depends on them. The aircraft is loaded with the aid of hydraulic drives, and a system consisting of several thousand sensors detects the slightest deformations of the airliner structure. If the safety margin recorded exceeds the calculated safety margin, the structure can be simplified. And if it's vice versa, it'll have to be ruggedized, which means that the aircraft will also gain weight. This endurance testing lab simulates the flight loads. The whole bench comes into motion to simulate a takeoff. The half wings bend upward, and after the landing, they return to their original position. These tests can last for about a year. 
If the engineers designed the plane to endure 10,000 flights, all of them will be modeled on this bench. But that's not all yet. At the end of the tests, the plane is literally destroyed in order to determine its fatal loads. Aluminum isn't called the winged metal for nothing. For more than 60 years, it has been the primary material used in aircraft construction. It's rather light, easy to process, and most importantly, it's well known. This aircraft and almost all others on this airfield are made of aluminum. Nevertheless, the era of winged metal, pretty much like the era of metal wings, is coming to an end. The properties of aluminum weren't flexible enough to develop breakthrough aerodynamic airfoils. After studying the configuration in vertical wind tunnels, we realized that it would be quite difficult to recreate a similar configuration using classic metals. This laboratory is used for cutting and laying out the layers of the future composite material. The main difference of the infusion technology is that it's not initially coated with a resin binder. In other words, it's dry carbon in finest threads that are formed into ribbons, bundled together by this thread. Up here is a laser projector which projects a pattern used for the future cutting. So, it turns out that you're cutting along the edges of ready-made patterns and at specified angles. So, that can be, how many degrees is it? Here, that's five degrees. Five, so it can be zero, or say 45, and you cut it depending on these layers and then stack these layers. Yes. Is that right? We lay various layers out in succession according to the blueprint. The Aero Composite plant has mastered the production of a composite wing for the new MC-21 aircraft using the infusion technology. It's cheaper than the autoclave technique used by other aircraft manufacturers. Its fundamental difference is that the binding component that adheres to the dry carbon fibers enters the form part under vacuum in the infusion chamber. The autoclave technology works with a prepeg and it's already coated with resin, which is why its working life has a distinct time limit. When making each composite part, a so-called secondary panel is produced. It is made from the same carbon fiber and has the same filler. Moreover, it undergoes the infusion process alongside with the primary part. In the end, we get kind of a clone. Then it is cut into 600 witness samples like this one, and they undergo dozens of tests in this laboratory to confirm that the main part complies with all the specifications stated by the engineers. Let's see. Just look at this plate. Let's put this into perspective. Composite material and aluminum. The difference is, well, this bump here is probably almost half an inch deep. Plus, there's a deep crack that completely rips through the metal. So in this test, the composite material turned out to be, well, significantly stronger. Provided that at the same dimensions, this plate is 1.5 times lighter than the aluminum one. The surface area of this wing is 215 square yards, and it's similar for other medium-haul airliners too. It is clear that laying out the carbon layers of such surface area manually is impossible. That is why robotics technologies are widely used at factories that produce the composite wings. The plant in Ulyanovsk is still the only place in the country capable of producing components this large from composite materials. The design concept is identical to the one used in the laboratory in Moscow, but the scale is truly amazing. There are no broad carbon material sheets. Instead, a robot gradually lays out a 0.2 inch carbon tape on the harness, layer by layer. When all layers are ready, they are covered with bagging film and placed into the infusion chamber. The adhesive composition is fed into the billet and the forming process of the future structure takes place. 
It's quite hard to put aluminum into such a complex shape. It would take a lot. Many molding stages will have to be carried out. And here we get a finished panel after just one technological cycle. Each plane is equipped with several onboard recorders, emergency recorders, and there are those that allow technicians to do maintenance work on the aircraft on a daily basis. In total, there are about a thousand sensors inside, recording the parameters of all kinds of systems, but the most stringent control of flight information is conducted in flying test beds. Aircraft prototypes, of course. The quantity of sensors used there can be up to 200,000. Flight test programs for new aircraft models have long been worked out, but the use of new composite materials requires a much closer look. The structure of the A350, built by a European consortium, is 52% carbon fiber, and this is the highest rate known in the civil aviation world today. The most important thing when it comes to using composites as a new material for the main load-bearing elements of a plane is to ensure the safety. So far, it's been a pain in the neck for the entire industry, since we don't have data from decades of service experience. We have to lay in large safety margins, look for reserves and calculation methods that can be substantiated experimentally, as well as new layup schedules and design concepts for the composite material. This is the McKinley Laboratory, the world's largest climate chamber. A350 was tested in conditions of extreme heat and cold here. In order for it to be possible to start engines in the closed hangar, pipelines have been constructed to remove exhaust gases. During the first testing stage, the aircraft was tested in extreme heat conditions at a temperature of 113 degrees Fahrenheit for a day. Data on the functioning of engines, air conditioning and hydraulics were obtained. During the high humidity testing, more attention was paid to the working efficiency of electrical systems. Lastly, the aircraft underwent testing in Arctic climate conditions. The temperature in the chamber was lowered to minus 40 degrees. The plane was covered with a thick layer of hoarfrost and the fog formed reduced the overall visibility to several meters. All systems were tested once again in these harsh conditions, including the water supply in the toilets. But the most important test was the trial run of the APU, the auxiliary power unit, performed using the internal electrical battery. Three, two, one, launch. The test was passed successfully and both main engines were started from the auxiliary power unit. Flight testing is the final stage of the new aircraft construction. A350 completed the entire testing program in little over a year, and soon the Russian MC-21 will start its own program. But even after successfully passing the tests, the aircraft will remain under the close surveillance of the experts, pretty much like any other airliner taking off into the sky. The pre-flight inspection of the aircraft comes to an end. The airliner is fueled and ready for flight. The final inspection is conducted by the pilot in command. Ivan, good afternoon. Hello. So I suppose that all that's left to do now is to perform the final pre-flight inspection, which is already being conducted by the pilot in command. Absolutely right. So the pre-flight inspection starts from the left side of the plane and... So there's a strict rule in place, and it's always done the same way, right? Yes, yes. It's always conducted the same way. It begins here, where we inspect the air pressure probes. Next is the nose landing gear. Here we must check for any torn cables, faulty wiring, and make sure the shock struck piston sticks out. It shouldn't be completely retracted. This indicates that the shock strut pumping is normal. Also, do you have to tap the pneumatics? There's no need to, no need to do that. All headlights must be intact. There shouldn't be any cracks. If they're cracked, we must inform the technical staff about it. 
and they'll have to be replaced before the plane takes off. Our master minimum equipment list allows to conduct flights without some of the headlights, especially during the daytime. So next, we take a look inside the wheel bay. We can turn the light on here and see if there are any foreign objects inside, then... Or any free riders. Or any free riders, right. Next, we check the lighting with the co-pilot, who's now in the cockpit. We use these gestures to show him that the respective light bulb is on. Well, as we can see, the aircraft is ready to take off. I didn't find any problems here, so everything is safe, all clear. Now, after all final checks have been completed, the plane can take off. Every day, more than 100,000 flights are completed worldwide, and each flight safety is backed up by thousands of tests the aviation equipment has to go through throughout its entire life cycle, from models in a wind tunnel to hard-working production aircraft. <laughs> 